All right, welcome to lecture 28. In this lecture, we're going to have a little more practice with the second law, namely the entropy equation. Um, the picture here obviously is of a cartoon. Uh, I thought it was humorous. Uh, anyway, let's go ahead and get started. The, the beginning of this lecture is really just going to be a review of some things that we've been talking about, and then I'll have a couple of examples to go through at the end of this lecture. Uh, just as a, an interesting point, after I go through the two examples for today's lecture, uh, I counted up all of the examples that I've been doing related to entropy and the entropy equation. And after the two from today, I'll have about 25 example problems that I've done related to this topic. Uh, many of them are in the book style notes that are included at the end of um, the previous set of notes there, so they're in the book style notes. But then I've done quite a few just live in these recorded lectures. So about 25 different examples that are available to you with worked out solutions. So hopefully you're going through those, uh, that these topics are making sense to you, and uh, they're helping you get through the homework problems. I've also been seeing a lot of a uh, lot of activity on the ME200 Tutorial Room Piazza blog. That's great. Keep referring to that. That's just fine. My blog for my, you know, my particular lecture section obviously is getting a lot less activity, and that's fine. But if you have something specific you'd like to ask me, ask me through my Piazza blog. The one that's for the Tutorial Room, really the TAs are managing that for the most part, so you'll get TA responses. I just keep a, an eye on it, but I don't really respond to the posts there. But if you want something from me specifically, then you should uh, go to the Piazza blog for my section in particular. Okay, so let me talk about what you're seeing on your screen here. Uh, I broke it down into three categories. This is just basically a review. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the tools that we've been using in ME200 so far. These are the main tools, or really kind of the basic equations. And what we have here are the, 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 the basic equations like conservation of mass, first law of thermodynamics. We've been dealing with that through most of the course, certainly up until the second exam. Now what we've done is we've added in essentially the second law of thermodynamics in this equation called the entropy equation. And the, the first two equations, conservation of mass and the first law, are really accounting equations. They just make sure everything's in balance, that the mass isn't created or destroyed. Same sort of thing with energy. It's not created or, or, or destroyed. It just changes form. It goes from work and heat transfer and internal energy. So the first two items here, conservation of mass and the first law, are really accounting uh, basic equations. The entropy equation, where we use it primarily is to determine whether a process can occur or not. Remember that for that for any real process, the entropy generation term, that sigma, has to be greater than or equal to zero. It's only equal if it's internally reversible, which is an idealization. And in any real process, it'll be greater than zero. It can never be negative. If it's negative, then that's impossible. So we use that entropy equation to determine whether or not a process is possible or not. And it can also be used to determine conditions for the ideal case. When we set that internal, when we set that entropy generation term, the sigma, to zero in the entropy equation, then we can solve for, let's say, like the heat transfer in the ideal case. And then we can make use of that heat transfer, for example, in the first law of thermodynamics. So the entropy equation can tell us whether or not a process can occur. And we can also use it to look at conditions when we have an ideal case, one that's internally reversible. The last item, the last sort of uh, tool I have listed here are cycle performance measures. What I mean by that is something like the, the expression for the thermal efficiency for, uh, for, let's say, like a power cycle. So we have something like that, or the coefficients of performance for a refrigeration cycle or a heat pump cycle. So that's what I mean by the cycle performance measures. 
The last thing I have listed here is in parentheses is applied to control volumes because all of these four items that I've listed here really are applied to control volume. So make sure that when you use them, you show your control volume, make it clear which control volume you're using. And then it's also helpful to include the energy flow diagrams showing where heat and work and mass are going into or out of the control volumes. Okay. Underneath the primary tools here, we have the supporting tools. These are things that go, that, that help support the the tools up above it. So these actually kind of kind of are used in those basic equations. So we have property tables, of course, for looking up thermodynamic properties of the various materials that we use. So I, one thing I should just mention is these equations up here, these are independent of the kind of material that you're using. So conservation of mass, for example, is can be used for solids, liquids, gases, um, anything any kind of material you want to deal with. All of these basic equations hold for anything. The supporting tools down here, like the property tables, that's what narrows it down to a particular type of material or class of material. So individual property tables can give us properties for very specific kinds of materials. Compressed liquid approximations we've used for, obviously, compressed liquids. The incompressible substance model and the ideal gas model are for particular classes of materials. So things that can be assumed to be nearly incompressible or behave in, as an ideal gas. So can be used, you know, for example, incompressible substance that could be used for solids or liquids. An ideal gas, there are many gases that we can treat as an ideal gas, like air, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, um, you know, helium, those kinds of things. So these are for classes of materials. But we have, within the incompressible substance model or the ideal gas model, we have ways of finding the various properties like pressure, specific internal energy, specific enthalpy, specific entropy, etc. So a couple of, a few other things that we use as supporting tools. Occasionally we use the definition of the specific enthalpy. That's just this expression that I'm writing down here. So sometimes it's convenient to use that definition. We also have the TDS relations that we derived uh, just recently in a couple of, in a, a lecture a couple of lectures ago. These just relate properties again for just in general between various uh, other properties like entropy and specific enthalpy and specific internal energy, temperature, etc. So those are sometimes useful. And then lastly, I put here work calculations. These are the calculations that support the first law equation. So calculating the amount of work done for boundary work or for electrical work or spring work or shaft work, those kinds of things. So that, those are supporting tools. All right. So we have our basic equations up here at the top. These are our fundamental laws. We have some supporting relations that help us apply those equations to specific types of materials or specific instances. And then we have at the very end here common assumptions. These help us simplify the equations further for very specific cases. So in most of our, essentially all of our thermo problems, we make the quasi-equilibrium process assumption, just meaning that everything, that all of our processes are basically in a state of equilibrium at every point in the process. The, uh, that just means that we're, we're for, our processes are occurring slowly enough that we don't have any significant imbalances within the system. So for example, like if I was changing the pressure in the system, I would be changing the pressure slowly enough so that the pressure everywhere inside the system is uniform. Okay, um, the 1D or uniform flow assumption, I haven't talked about too much, but this occurs when we have inlets. So for example, if I had a flow going into a tank like this. We, uh, we, I haven't said it very often, but the 1D or uniform flow assumption just means that the, that the properties as you cross kind of this way through the, through the pipe, all those properties are uniform. The velocity is all the same velocity. Specific enthalpy is all the same specific enthalpy. You just don't have, you don't have any variations in this, let me call this the y direction. There are no variations in the y direction here. Okay, 
So that's what a 1D or uniform flow assumption means is that you don't have to worry about variations in the Y direction. Next we have steady state or steady flow. I've talked about these before. Steady state just means that, uh, again let me kind of show a box here with some flow coming into it and going out of it. Steady state just means that inside this control volume that I've drawn here, inside it doesn't change with time. Steady flow means that the, the mass flow rate coming in and going out, those, are, those aren't changing with time either. That it's just the same mass flow rate going in or the same mass flow rate going out. Okay, so that's steady flow. Negligible kinetic or and or potential energies, we've made that assumption many times. Those are usually pretty good if other terms in, let's say, the first law dominate and those kinetic and potential energy terms are small, then we can neglect them. Adiabatic, of course, we've used that many times that there's no heat transfer. Passive corresponds to a situation where there's no work to consider, that basically you're dealing with like a, a rigid box that has no electrical connections, um, no rotating shafts, no springs, that sort of thing. Uh, the next bullet point is uh, types of processes that we've been encountering. So isothermal processes where the temperature remains constant. Make sure you note that isothermal and adiabatic are not necessarily, they're not the same thing. Adiabatic refers to heat transfer being zero. Isothermal just says temperature is constant. They're different. Isobaric means the pressure remains constant. Isochoric, we rarely use that term, but that just is a, a constant volume process. And recently we've talked about isentropic, that's where the entropy remains constant. We often make the assumption of an incompressible substance or an ideal gas, we've talked about that already. We've talked uh, in recent examples about constant specific heat assumptions, that's usually used when you're dealing with temperature ranges that aren't too large. So we can get away with assuming a constant specific heat. And then most recently, we've made the assumption of internally reversible processes. That's where the entropy generation term, that sigma, is zero. So that one is one that we've used recently, and we'll make use of that more and more frequently because now we're starting to move into a part of the course where we're going to look at operating um, we're going to look at processes or operating uh, equipment like a turbine or a com compressor, things like that, in its most efficient way, and that will correspond to an internally reversible process. Okay, so that'll be it for this lecture. I'll go through some example, uh, just two examples in a moment in uh, separate videos, but I just wanted to recap the various tools that we've been using now that we've added the entropy equation and um, uh, the idea of isentropic flows or internally reversible flows, things of that nature. I just wanted to recap this. What you see here on the screen is is much of what ME200 is all about. Um, at, there, we'll only add a few more things to this list. Um, really, actually, the rest of the course before too long will be applying all of these tools you see here to various cycles, various thermodynamic cycle. So really we've covered most of all of the tools that you'll learn in the course and now from here till the end it'll be mostly just applying those tools. So we've covered the, the vast majority of the oops the vast majority of the, the the actual tools that we'll learn. Okay so we'll end it there and then like I said there'll be a couple of examples in separate videos.